Hi, this is Carly, a recovered alcoholic, episode 20 of North Star Big Book. We are on We Agnostics, part two, at the way top of page 46. So just to review, this is Bill struggling with the idea of a higher power. An agnostic means one who does not have the knowledge. So you could believe in a higher power or you could not believe as an agnostic, but we don't use and rely on that power. And at the way top it said, we looked upon this world of warring individuals, warring theological systems, and inexplicable calamity with deep skepticism. We looked askance at many individuals who claimed to be godly. How could a supreme being have anything to do with it at all? And who could comprehend a supreme being anyhow? Yet in other moments we found ourselves thinking, when enchanted by a starlit night, who then made all this? There was a feeling of awe and wonder, but it was fleeting and soon lost. So this is just reminding me of the human struggle I think many of us have when we try to understand this concept of a higher power. And we look at all the things that are wrong with the world and we say, if there's a God, where is the God now? But then we look at a beautiful starlit night or I stand in front of the ocean and I feel so small while the ocean feels so big and it has such a beautiful rhythm. And I look at a starry night or I look at nature, or I look at a new baby, and something beautiful like that makes me know and wonder, well, then how could there not be? And what they're saying here is that this is based on this idea of wonder and awe, and that is something that we can use towards our higher power. I wrote on the top of the page, can't begin with faith. So I can't have faith. If I don't have faith, I don't have faith. That just means I don't have evidence in my life that I know something. I wrote, have to begin with belief. So the first time I ever did this work in AA, I did it because I was miserable and what I was doing, I was not getting results. Hanging out with new guys, hanging out all night long, playing cards and smoking cigarettes and not drinking but being miserable was not producing the results I wanted in AA. And it wasn't until the first time I sat down with a woman in her book and she took me through this and told me about the hard work I was going to need to do. When I started doing my fourth step, which was the first time I had to do action, I didn't know that this was going to work. I just believed in a hopeful way that it would because she told me it worked for her, but I didn't know. And if it didn't work, I wouldn't have been surprised. So the first time I did it, I did it because I was desperate and I had no other solution. So I had to believe when I got through four through nine the first time I ever did it, I was able to look back with knowledge and know that doing that kind of inventory work and clearing out my pathway and my hallway and going to my higher power and making amends where I have caused damage clears me out in a way that nothing else could. And the results I got from it were my own evidence. And that is faith. So faith only happens when you do something and you get results and you get evidence. You cannot have faith until you've tried it. So we start with belief. The first real paragraph says, yes, we have agnostic temperament, that's someone who doesn't know, have had these thoughts and experiences. Let us make haste to reassure you. And I underline the rest of the paragraph. We found, that's the first 100 men and women, that as soon as we were able to lay aside prejudice, I bracketed as soon as, and that's the time frame that we can get these results, as soon as we were able to lay aside prejudice and express even, I double underline the word willingness, and I wrote on the side, the key. Being willing is the key. The way that I become willing is I'm miserable. Miserable and desperate and out of plans is how Carly becomes willing. The way that you know that a girl or a guy you're working with is willing is they do whatever you ask them to out of the book. Even a willingness to believe in a power greater than ourselves, we commence, which means we began, to get results. I circled the word results. I wrote on the side, am I getting results? Question mark. Am I getting results? So one of my favorite questions to ask anyone who wants to argue about this is, are you getting the results you want with what you're currently doing? And if they're, if they are, then you can say to them, well, then why are you here? You know, why did you ask me to meet with you? Why do you want to do this work? Cause I only wanted to do the work when the results I was getting were not what I wanted. It says, even though it was impossible for any of us to fully define or comprehend that power, which is God. And I wrote on the side, none of us can explain or understand fully God. None of us can explain or understand fully God. And that's okay. 
I can't. I've been sober for over 19 years and I can't fully explain or comprehend God. I have a better comprehension and conception of my higher power today at 19 years sober than I did at 11 years sober. But at 11 years sober, my conception of my higher power worked perfectly for me until it didn't. And so just like our phones that we're holding, we are constantly upgrading and getting a bigger God or a faster God or something that we need to help us deal with whatever we're dealing with. What I do believe out of my own evidence, which is my faith, is that I will always get what I need from God. It says, and that's the second step promise, what we just read. That even you start where you are, as soon as you want it and you show willingness, you get results. That's the promise. It says, much to our relief, we discovered we did not need to consider another's conception of God. So the first 100 men and women are telling us, we didn't have to believe what someone else believed. I underlined this next part. Our own conception, however inadequate, was sufficient to make the approach and to effect a contact with him. So I put a star there. That's really important. Whatever we can conceive, even if it's so inadequate, is enough. That's what sufficient means. To make the approach and to effect a contact with him. When a child comes to a parent and they're scared and they ask for help... If the parent is sane and loving and warm and kind, they're not going to make the child rephrase how they come to them. If they see that they're coming to them and asking for help humbly, we are going to embrace them and and meet them where they are. That's what a good parent does. A good parent meets the child where they are, not where the parent wants them to be. That's a demanding, controlling, illogical parent. God, to me, my God is a good parent. I underlined, as soon as we admitted the possible existence of a creative intelligent, a spirit of the universe underlying the totality of things, we began to be possessed of a new sense of power and direction. I underlined, provided we took other simple steps. And I wrote on the side, 3 through 12. So we will get this power and direction provided I follow it through with 3 through 12. I'm going to have this um, little feeling when I make the decision that there's something bigger than me to help me, but it will go away really quickly if I don't follow it up with action. We found, that's the first 100 men and women, that God does not make too hard terms with those who seek him. To us, the realm of spirit is broad, roomy, all-inclusive, never exclusive or forbidding to those who earnestly seek. It is open, we believe, to all men. And I wrote on the bottom of the page, God will reveal himself to us as we seek. God will reveal himself to us as we seek. You know, the first thing that I remember in AA about my relationship with God was when they were talking, when when the people that were sober were talking to me about God, and I was like, I don't know, I don't know how to do this. And they said, well, what do you need God to be? And I said, I need God to be courage because I don't have any courage. And so they said, well, then your God's going to be courage. So I would pray to courage. I would pray to ask for courage. And then God would give me that. On the top of 47, I wrote, we become willing. We become willing to change when what, when we see, we become willing to change when we see that what we are doing isn't working. We become willing to change when we see that what we are doing isn't working. The only time I'm ever willing to do anything is once I've realized what I'm doing is not working. In the middle of any experiment I'm having, I'm not going to stop and change and do something different if I still believe and I can still see that there's a possibility that my idea can work. I underline the next sentence on 47. When, therefore, we speak to you of God, we mean, and I underline and starred, your own conception of God. So what you need God to be, what you believe a higher power is. And if you don't like that word, all those capital letters, supreme being, um, spirit of the universe, creative intelligence, these are all realm of spirit. These are all different words that the big book is giving me for God. You can just call it power or higher power or power greater than myself. It says, this applies too to other spiritual expressions which you find in this book. Do not let any prejudice you may have against spiritual terms deter you, and I underlined, from honestly asking yourself what they mean to you. And that's what this whole program is about, is I get to constantly ask myself, in each moment, in each time I'm approaching a new idea, what does this mean to me? And that question changes, the answers change as I grow on my path. At the start, this was, I underlined, all we needed to commence spiritual growth. 
So the book is telling me again, the only thing I need to start spiritually growing is to ask what it means to me. And what I need God to be today is still courage, but it's a lot more because my needs in my life have grown so much bigger. It says, to affect our first conscious relation with God, I underlined, as we understood him. I don't know how many times they say that in our book, but it's beautiful and it's one of our best-selling features. That you can believe whatever you want to believe. It says, afterward, we found ourselves accepting many things which then seemed entirely out of reach. That was growth. But, I underlined, if we wished to grow, we had to begin somewhere. And I underline the next sentence. So we used our own conception, however limited it was. I bracketed this next paragraph and I underlined everything. And above it, I wrote step two. And then in big letters, I wrote the word ask. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to read this and we're going to ask ourselves and we're going to ask whoever we're working with. So if you're doing this in a big book study, you guys should pause after you read this and ask. We needed to ask ourselves but one short question. Do I now believe? So that's the first part of the question. So do you believe in a higher power? The answer is yes or no. Or am I even willing to believe? So if you don't believe in a higher power, are you willing to believe? And if that makes you uncomfortable, it says that there's a power greater than myself. As soon as a man can say that he does believe, above that is an agnostic. So someone who does believe but doesn't rely is called agnostic or, I underline the word or, is willing to believe that's an atheist. They would like to believe, but they don't believe. A question I ask after this is, if you don't believe and you don't, you're not willing to believe, are you willing to work towards willingness to believe? Or do you want to continue as you are with nothing but yourself? I've never, ever had someone say that they want to never have a God. When I explain to them what my higher power is like for me, how... My God only wants good things for me and but cannot stop the bad things that happen, but is there for me when they happen and gives me what I need. And I can come to with anything without judgment, no embarrassment, just complete non-judgment love. I say to them, would you like that? So you don't feel alone and so you can feel like you have some guidance and connection and strength. And they're like, yeah, I mean, who doesn't want that? It says, it is, I underline, It has been repeatedly proven among us that upon this simple cornerstone, a wonderfully effective spiritual structure can be built. So there they are talking again about the structure. Next to built, I wrote the word foundation and I wrote the belief. So believing that this could work for me is my foundation. And my willingness is my simple cornerstone. And again, I get willing from desperation. That's why it's called the gift of desperation. The walk home from the hospital after I tried killing myself was my gift of desperation because I was desperate and tired and out of plans and I didn't have anywhere else to go and that meant I was going to be willing to try something that was different. And ultimately, that's alcoholism. That's step one. Alcoholism makes me willing, which is why we want to get people immediately when they walk in the door, when they're desperate and willing to start doing the work. Because otherwise their mental obsession will tell them the lie that they don't need to do it. I wrote on the side, my problem is what I believe. My problem is what I believe. And it's still my problem. You know, I still struggle with things like body stuff, which is so annoying to me and Part of my logical mind knows that this is totally lame and not important, and I don't want to be like this anymore, but the part of me that was sick for a lot lot of time about this knows that this is also part of my growth process, but what I believe is what, what, my problem is what I believe, so when I believe that I'm X, Y, or Z, my problem is my belief, not what I actually am, because most of the time I'm completely distorting what is real, so it's my belief is my problem. I also wrote, whatever we believe, we become. So if we believe that we're always going to be a failure and that we're never going to get sober, then that we will, be, what we believe, we will become. Um, there's this awesome quote from one of these motivational speakers I listened to, and he says, if you think you can or you think you cannot, you are right. And it's whatever you believe is, is your truth. And so if you believe you can do this and that you can change your life, you will. But if you believe that this will never work, you'll sabotage it. It says, that was great news to us, for we had assumed we could not make use of spiritual principles unless we accepted many things on faith which seemed difficult to believe. I wrote on the side, came to believe, 
came to believe, and then in parentheses I wrote, not know, like K-N-O-W. We didn't come to know, we came to believe. We don't know until we're at 10 and 11. And we don't truly know until we're at 12 working with others. When people presented us with spiritual approaches, how frequently did we all say, I wish I had what that man has. I'm sure it would work if I could only believe as he believes. But I cannot accept as surely true the many articles of faith which are so plain to him. I underline the next sentence. So it was comforting to learn that we could commence at a simpler level. Besides a seeming inability to accept much on faith... On 48, we often found ourselves handicapped by handicapped by these things, I underline them, obstinacy, which is being stubborn, sensitiveness, and unreasoning prejudice, which is to prejudge a situation before you've actually experienced it. And I wrote above that blocks us from God. So if I'm stubborn, I'm overly sensitive, or I'm upset about something that I say that I don't want to do or I don't like or doesn't work, but I've never done it, these things can block me from God. Today, early in sobriety and today in sobriety. Many of us have been so touchy that even casual reference to spiritual things made us bristle with antagonism. I underlined the next sentence and I highlighted it. This sort of thinking, we're not talking about our drinking, had to be abandoned. And I circled the word abandoned. They use this word abandoned often when we're approaching step three. Because they want us to let go of it like something that's broken. Though some of us resisted, we found no great difficulty in casting aside such feelings. Faced with, I circled and underlined in red, alcoholic destruction, because that's what we're faced with, we soon became as open-minded on spiritual matters as we had tried to be on other questions. So again, I'm only open-minded when nothing else works. I might look really willing and open-minded, but that's after I've completely destroyed everything. In this respect, alcohol was a great persuader, which is what I was just talking about. I underlined in red, it finally beat us into a state of reasonableness. And I wrote on the side, what alcoholism does. Alcoholism makes me reasonable because I'm desperate and miserable and I'm done. Which is why if you have someone you're working with and they don't want to do the work, you don't have to do anything other than tell them you are here to support them when they're ready to do the work and stop trying to bother them because alcoholism will bring them back or it'll kill them. Either way, we're not powerful enough to do anything. Sometimes this was a tedious process. We hope no one else will be prejudiced for as long as some of us were. The reader may still ask why he should believe in a power greater than himself. We think there are good reasons. Let us have a look at some of them. The practical individual today is a stickler for facts and results. Nevertheless, the 20th century readily accepts the theories of all kinds provided they are firmly grounded in fact. We have numerous theories, for example, about electricity. Everybody believes them without a murmur of doubt. Why this ready acceptance? I don't ever, when I turn on my light switch, I never think, oh, I wonder if the light's going to work and travel and the electricity is going to do all it needs to do. Like, I don't think like that. And that just, it's just assumed. I don't understand how it works. If somebody tried to explain it to me, I would zone out. But I just know that it works because it does. Why this ready acceptance? Simply because it is impossible to explain what we see, feel, direct, and use without a reasonable assumption at a starting point. Everybody nowadays believes in scores of assumptions for which there is good evidence but no perfect visual proof. And does not science demonstrate that visual proof is the weakest proof? It is being constantly revealed as mankind studies the material world that I underlined outward appearances are not inward reality at all. So a couple of things. That's one of my favorite things in the book because it's one of the truths I need to remember often, especially when I'm looking at others' outsides and comparing their outsides with my insides, that outward appearances are not usually inward reality. That's number one. And the other thing I wrote here, I wrote on the side, the wind. And I'll share this with you. So I remember being new in sobriety and trying to understand this concept of something that you can believe in but you can't see. Um, and how do you explain that to someone who doesn't believe? Because I, I was lucky enough to believe. I just didn't understand. Um, and I was at a park. I was in my car at a light, at a red light, heading home from work. And I looked out the left window, the driver's window, and there was a median of grass. And it was summertime. And I remember the grass was tall. And I remember thinking, the grass is moving. What's making the grass move? Well, I know what's making the grass move. It's the wind. And I thought to myself, huh, the wind. I believe in wind, and if I went up to anyone on the street that's able to speak 
you know, the same language as me, I could ask them, what is making those flowers or leaves or grass move? And they would say the wind. And I would be like, well, how do you know it's wind? And they'd be like, well, because it's just wind. I can see that it's wind. And I'll be like, well, have you ever touched wind? And they're like, well, no, but I felt wind. And we're like, well, have you ever, you know, heard wind talk to you other than the sound that it makes when it hits other things? And they're like, no. And I'm like, well, how do you believe in wind? And what we what I came up with in my mind was that we believe in the effect that the wind has on me and on the things I look at. And I don't ever question it. I'm sure there's many different languages for the word wind, but all of us believe it's wind. And we don't wonder, well, is it really wind? Because I've never seen wind. And I think about my higher power like that. I've never seen my higher power, but I've seen the effects my higher power has on the world and upon myself. It says, uh, here's, I'm going to illustrate from the book. And eventually one day I'm going to be working with a girl who's going to be really excited about this part. I've never had that happen yet, but maybe one day. So it says, the prosaic steel girder is a mass of electrons whirling around each other at an incredible speed. So we're on the top of 49. These tiny bodies are governed by precise laws. And these laws hold true throughout the material world. Science tells us so. We have no reason to doubt it. When I underline the word however... The perfectly logical assumption is suggested that underneath the material world and life as we see it, there is, here's some capital letters, an all-powerful, guiding, creative intelligence. Right there, our perverse streak comes to the surface and we laboriously set out to convince ourselves it isn't so. I wrote on the top of 49, trying to get the newcomer to believe, to be willing to believe. Trying to get the newcomer to be willing to believe. So we're, they're using stories here to try to get us to understand. And I also wrote down faith equals knowledge. It's the same thing. One of the people I love in AA says he doesn't need faith. He's got evidence. Because the first time we try anything, we don't know. We have to believe. We don't know. We're scared. We don't know how it's going to work out. But after we've done it and experienced it, then we have our own evidence. It says, I underline, we read wordy books and indulge in windy arguments. So these are things that can block me off from just being able to believe. Thinking we believe this universe needs no God to explain it. Were our contentions true, it would follow that life originated out of nothing, means nothing, and proceeds nowhere. Instead of regarding ourselves as intelligent agents, spearheads of God's ever-advancing creation, I underline the rest of the paragraph. We agnostics and atheists chose to believe that our human intelligence was the last word, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and end of all. Rather vain of us, wasn't it? When, he t when the book is talking about intelligent agents, I like to think about this time in my sobriety when it was before I had kids, before I was married, and before I had like real responsibilities, and I was young, sober, and I was in college, and I was learning, and I was excited about life, and not that I'm not excited about life today, but like my my responsibilities were very, very minimal. I remember thinking that I, me and God are like, I'm like the agent and God's like in charge, like I'm the spy and God's like in charge and a good spy doesn't want to know more information than they need because if they get captured, they'll get like tortured out of them. So God gives me one direction and it's to go to this place and then I go to that place and if I listen and I'm quiet, I'll get my next direction and I don't need to know, it's not my business to know everything else. And, you know, if I'm in a really good spiritual place, I focus on what's not my business and what's my business. Um, my son and I just climbed the Terminal Tower last weekend. And when I climbed um, the Sears Tower, which was 103 floors, I was really overwhelmed when I was on, like, floor three because I looked up at the each floor had the big number. Like, you're on floor three, which in my mind, I immediately went, oh, my God, I have 100 more floors to go. How am I going to do this? I'm never going to be able to do this. And what I came up with during that climb was to not look at the numbers, to keep my my eyes focused on my feet so I didn't fall while I was doing the climb, and to only focus on what I was doing in that moment, that it was not my business what floor I was on, because whether I knew the information or not, I wasn't going to stop. My goal was to keep going until I reached the top. So I was not, I made a rule I was not allowed to look at the numbers, and it wasn't my business when I was going to get to the top.
My only job was to climb. And I use that again when I did this because I've been sick for like a year, like a year it feels like. And I was climbing with my son who like flew ahead of me and I didn't feel well. And I saw the numbers and I thought, I cannot look at the numbers. I just need to get to the top. And that is how I wish I could live my life on a regular basis, which would be, it's none of my business what you think or what you're going to do or what's going to happen next or how it's going to work out or what my career is going to become and all that stuff. It's only my business what I'm doing right now. And I very rarely live like that. And that's a true believer. Um, The next paragraph I bracketed and I wrote on the side, results of a spiritual life or new mind. So I wrote results of a spiritual life or new mind. And I underlined, we who have traveled this dubious path beg you to lay aside prejudice. And the word dubious is an uncertain outcome. So we're traveling this uncertain outcome. And the big book, The First 100 Men and Women, are begging me to lay aside prejudice. And I wrote on the top the word prejudice. And I broke it, I wrote equals to prejudge. And it says, even against un even against organized religion, we have learned that whatever the human frailties of various faiths may be, those faiths have given, I underlined, purpose and direction to millions. Here's the thing. Nothing I did before I got sober gave me purpose and direction, except maybe when I was tripping on a drug for like eight hours, I felt purposeful and directed. And then when I came to, I couldn't remember any of my truth. And I was sick as can be. Nothing in AA gave me purpose and direction until I worked the steps. Because going to meetings and not drinking did not give me purpose and direction. I just got angry and insane. I have purpose and direction today because my purpose and direction is I need to keep doing this work. I need to do 4 through 9, clear out the hallway, and daily do 10, 11, and 12, and reach out to the next person and extend my hand. It's my... uh, obligation and responsibility and today I know that my purpose and direction is to be a channel for God it says people of faith which means knowledge have a I underline a logical idea of what life is all about it doesn't mean I understand the whole world because I don't there's so much I don't understand but when I come down to my my simple quiet place I know exactly what I'm supposed to do in each situation. And when I don't, the book tells me what to do, which is to pause and ask. It says, actually, we used to, ha- we used to have no reasonable conception, whatever. We used to amuse ourselves by cynically dissecting spiritual beliefs and practices when we might have observed that, I underlined, many spiritually minded persons of all races, colors, and creeds were demonstrating a degree of, I underline, stability, happiness, and usefulness. And I wrote on the bottom, promises for spiritual people. That spiritually minded people, regardless of where you come from, are stable, happy, and useful. For me, the third one, which is useful, is the whole reason why I can become stable and happy. The the easiest equation I have learned in Alcoholics Anonymous that I can apply in any area of my life is when I am useful, I am feel okay and it can be so small like pulling down the paper at the women's bathroom in a public restroom so the next person doesn't have to drip all over their arms wiping up a counter at a coffee shop while I'm waiting for whatever I'm getting letting somebody ahead of me in line letting someone ahead of me in the you know checkout line in the car line cleaning up messes that are not mine because I've left messages my whole entire life um telling someone how I feel about them just because anytime I'm doing something where I'm giving of myself and making someone else's life a little bit better, I feel happy or at the least I just feel okay. And there's never a time when I'm focusing on self that I always get the results of stable and happy. Um, let's go to page 50 and then we're going to stop. So It says, instead, we looked at the human defects of these people and sometimes used their shortcomings as a basis of wholesale condemnation. We talked of intolerance while we were intolerant ourselves. That's like me complaining about the people that are gossiping and telling you who it is while I'm gossiping about them. I underlined, we miss the reality and the beauty of the forest because we were diverted by the ugliness of some of its trees. 
And like I shared before, that used to be my favorite sentence in the entire big book because it really blew my mind open because I did miss everything. I only focused on the ugliness and I couldn't see anything else. And when I was taught in AA to see and look for the beauty and the gifts and the opportunities and the places where I can be useful, I could see the beauty of the forest. So we are going to stop right there after it says we never gave the spiritual side of life a fair hearing. And we will start next week on the page 50. Thank you. I hope you have an amazing week. It's all up to you.